Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, this is the second part of our uh, datafication and community activism workshop. And this is also um, doubling as our department seminar in the Department of Informatics. Um, so we're gonna have a talk today from a friend of the department, Mimi Stiles. Um, and then in terms of business, I think we're, this is just regular seminar rules, right? We're just, we have the chat open if people wanna ask questions. Okay, great. So Daniel and I will watch the, the chat for Daniel. So thanks everybody for coming. And um, I'm gonna now introduce Mimi Stiles. Uh, Mimi founded Measure in 2015 to promote the use of evidence-based projects and tools to tell real life stories behind the numbers. Um, Measure has evolved as an organization and now offers free data support to black and brown led community based organizations. They're also responsible for strategic partnerships with the University of Texas, Texas Southern University and other institutions with a goal of disrupting traditional research uh, in exchange for black and brown led experience lit, excuse me, black and brown led lived experience protocols. Uh, Mimi is an AARO McBee Fellow, past chairwoman of Miss Juneteenth, Austin Police Chief's Award of Excellence recipient, past chairwoman of African TV5, and the Austin Black Chamber's 2017 Community Leader of the Year. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in Communications and also holds a Master of Public Administration with a concentration in National Security. So this is Mimi's second time coming to the department um, to tell us about her work, and we're just really thrilled that she could come back and talk to us. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Mimi. There. Woohoo. Listen, everyone, before I get started, I just kind of want to take a pulse in the room. If you um, identify as a as a researcher, type researcher inside of the chat. If you identify as an activist, type activist inside of the chat. Um, if you identify as a researcher and activist, then say researcher activist. If you identify as a techie, go ahead and plus put techie in the in the chat. If you identify as a techie and an activist, go ahead and put a tech activist. So we have a researcher. We have a researcher and techie. I love it. Ooh, re re yes. And if you're a researcher and techie, go ahead and mix it, mix it and match it, whatever feels right. Um, Good. I love this. Ooh, we got a bunch of you guys are my people. Wait a minute. See, I didn't I didn't realize this. So you guys are my folks. Tech activists, Marvin, woo -woo, shout out to you. Um, awesome. Fantastic. Love it. Researcher and activist media. I'm glad you're here too. All right, um, I just I had to get comfortable. So now I am. Um, and I'm so excited to be here and to talk with you all. But first, before I really kind of introduce myself and what I do, I have, I have a question for you. Um, and before I share my screen, I have something that I want you guys to think about. And so what if I told you that our responsibility to humanity was to heal through research and study? And so what if I told you that a decision to contribute to the social sciences or to research was also a, dis a decision to disrupt and unravel the very fabric that has woven our world together under this made up structure of racism that has actually produced real trauma. That's heavy. What if I told you that you researchers, tech activists, researchers that are also um, techies that are activists, what if I told you that you, that we are chosen at this moment to uproot centuries, a centuries old tree, uproot that tree that has the understanding of racism and then replant new seedlings of justice, of empathy, of equity, of fairness, of power through research. So normally the call to action, that's, it's, it's usually placed like at the end of a speech or a message, but on this day, in this year, in, in this unprecedented year, let me say, 
in this hour, in this moment, it cannot wait. We cannot wait. Our responsibility is just, it's just way too much right now. It's way too great. Narrative change. So what, so how do we change the narrative? Something that we talk about a lot, right? First of all, what is the narrative? The narrative told us that black women would endure or can endure more pain during childbirth. The narrative told us, as a matter of fact, on March 12th, 1851, that there was an illness, a sickness, a virus affecting black slaves called drapedomania. Two Greek words to explain our black flight when enslaved. Drapedus, that means to run away. Mania, that means madness. The researcher who planted this false narrative um, to the Medical Association of Louisiana, hence to the world, his name was Samuel A. Cartwright. And at the same time, he announced that there was a cure. That cure was to keep black slaves in the sunken place to ensure their benevolent state of submission. Narrative change, right? Narrative change. It's our responsibility as researchers, as contributors to this ecosystem of social justice, as activists, as techtivists, as researcher activists, whichever way you wanna spin it, it's our responsibility to push back to change the narrative through the superpower that we were born with, through our voice, through our stories, through our research, through our science, through the truth. And so for measure, we use um, our evaluation tools to include the care model to change that narrative. And I am so excited that I get to be able to share with you guys today a little bit about the work that we do at measure. Let me, um, and I'm sorry, I know that was heavy to start it off, but. I feel like that's the call to action. So if there's any, if, if you tune me out here within the next 15 minutes, at least you're gonna go home with that. All right, hope you guys can see that fine. So a person's greatest superpower is their capacity to drive social change. So throughout history, We've seen these great movements um, that promote good and awareness that have been driven by leaders, passionate leaders, right? Or, or folks that are just completely fed up, um, whether it's women's suffrage or whether it's the civil rights movement or whether it's the gay rights movement or the Black Lives Matter or resistance against apartheid, the movement for indigenous rights. Um, humanity's unwillingness to accept the status quo and commitment to realizing a new normal marked these efforts of advancement and positive change. And so as we acknowledge the, the results of these world changing social movements and still we're, we're still trying to understand the results of these movements, I'd like to suggest to you all today that data activism is also a movement. And it's a movement that has produced tra a transformational shift from the old ways of embracing um, and understanding research. And that is what I, that's what I really wanna get into today. So the data activism movement, um, while it's not you know, dripping in heart-wrenching realities of mistreatment or systemic racism or oppression, it has a, it's taken on a life of its own. It has, it's, it's becoming its own philosophy. It's becoming a thing is what I like to say, as it moves out of the ranks of academia, of just out, <laughs> at, at just not just in the uh, brick and mortar, but it's now into the minds and into the practice of community members, of researchers, of open databases, of, uh, of activists. And so the data activism movement, it's multifaceted, it's complex, 
but it's embracing on this diverse culture, um, which I'm excited to be a part of it. But still make no mistake that it is, that there's nothing new under the sun. My organization, um, we hold space for one of the first black women who is also a data activist, um, Ida B. Wells. That's who you see in front of you right now. She was a prominent journalist. She was an activist. She was a researcher. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, is when she did her work. And in her lifetime, she battled sexism, um, racism, violence. She used her skills as a journalist to shed light on the conditions of the African-American through the South. She shed, she shed light through data. Um, and so we honor her in this space. And as I honor my, my you know, our, our past, I also think about my, um, my own personal story and what got me here. And some people have heard this story before, but I'm going to tell it again, just because I like to do that. Um, first of all, I come from a, a home where my grandfather, he worked between the Black Panther Party and the community in the 60s um, in California, and he worked to create his own bridges of communication. Um, my father um, grew up in that home. However, my father was a Black Panther. So just imagine my grandfather who worked between the Black Panther Party and the community. My, he was actually a police commissioner too. So he drove around in a police car. Meanwhile, his son, my dad, and his older son, my, my uncle, um, little Charles, they were both Black Panther. So you can just imagine what went around in that on that dinner table, right? Like how, what kind of conversations were had. Um, and so hence, I grew up in a home of, um, of an activist, um, Mr. Talia Farrow, and I learned very early to use my voice at every single at every single opportunity. As a matter of fact, you're probably like, why does her why is why are we looking at chocolate milk well because when i was in third grade i think it was about third grade i was walking through the lunch line i looked at the offerings of what we could drink it was chocolate it was white milk sorry or it was juice and i asked myself well there should be chocolate milk remember i'm a little kid who's growing up in a home of a black panther okay so my mind in my head i said why isn't why does milk all why does all milk have to be white I said, why don't we have chocolate milk, right? And so I led, I led a whole entire movement for chocolate milk in third grade. I um, petitioned, I, I sent out petitions. I had third graders scribbling their name in crayon. I had um, teachers that also wrote their name down. I went to the principal, I lobbied and I had, and I made change um, at Pacifica Elementary School and to this day, um, well, they actually just gentrified the neighborhood and the school is gone, but when it was there that, to, you know, teachers could thank me for sugaring up their third grader before, before, um, before recess. So that was, that was me. But the thing was, is that I learned very early on that I could use my voice to create change. And I also learned in that moment that, you know, that I had the power of, of change with data, you know? But my question is now, as I'm thinking, and I have to always reflect on that story because I also want to know why, why would data activism, the work that I do now, be a method to lead to solutions to complex social problems? Why would data activism um, be, be sexy enough to even entice people to come together around this idea? How could data activism be the bridge? Data activism, it allows this unique space. This is what I've learned um, for community members to become an active partner in the process of advocating for themselves and then being backed up by the numbers. By collecting data, by applying research and rethinking old ways of doing things with our community 
We're able to, to create new insights that are led by numbers in order to help to change and to rewrite that narrative. When we look at the number of black girls suspended in schools as compared to their population data, then we can begin to make clear assessments of what actions need to be taken in order to facilitate equity. That's how data can be the bridge. It's these types of hard conversations that can possibly lead to new programs, to new policies that both tear down those barriers um, to the lack of equity that we see and widen the opportunity for people that are most impacted by disparate outcomes. And so I had a friend that told me that people, when they're listening to you, they, they usually only take away two things um, <laughs> during a speech. So I hope you take away that first part. Um, and then I also hope you take away this. Number one is to share data and to share data in a way that it can be used as a tool and not just simply like a flashlight, but we want data to be used as a hammer, a scalpel, right? We don't want it just to illuminate the problem, but we want it to break up that problem. I don't know if you can always fix it, but you can definitely break it up with the hammer. Two is that I want you to embrace research to local action. And so at Measure, um, we, uh, we believe that lived experience and quantitative data about complex social problems impacting people of color is not used effectively for change. And that's due to historical and structural racism through a lack of accessibility, um, through the lack of accessible data tools, um, and also because of a lack of village support. And so while Measure, we have several programs, our main solve is our ability to provide free data and evaluation support to black and brown led organizations. So when an organization is working to push back against the law, a policy, um, a, 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 a procedure, um, they, they come to measure and they'll partner with measure. And so what we do also in order for us to continue this work, it's we, 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 we also partner with white led organizations, um, with businesses and so forth, but we ask them to pay the full rate of our services so that we're able to do this for free for black or brown led organizations. That's our anti-racist model of working. And so measures tools, let me kind of, there it goes. So measure, we have these four evaluation tools um, and they've gone through an extensive community led process to ensure that we are authentically representing the people in our work. And so we, we routinely reevaluate our own tools and our own processes in order to make sure that our work is truly anti-racist. What you're seeing right now in front of you are those four evaluation tools that we use with our clients. And we use these four evaluation tools with whether you are a black or brown led organization or uh, you know, a, a white uh, led organization doesn't matter. Um, but you're able to go to our website and register for support. What we've learned at Measure is that without an equitable framework, this is important, without an equitable framework built in to public administration models or research tools, we risk that continual perpetuation of racism within our largest institutions and social services in America. We at Measure have realized that, we realized that early on as a grassroots organization, everybody just volunteering to do this work. And so during this time, we began to think very deeply about the development of new, of a new way of, um, of evaluating, of, of new evaluation methods and models. And one thing led to another, and these four tools have been developed. As a matter of fact, the measure care model, that's our big tool um, that was really in, in, with the support of like 400 community members, 25 community leaders within Austin, all helped to contribute to the development of that tool. And so um, let me kind of give you a, 
a, a rundown of, of, the, of the care model. So this is, again, it's a process of working in active partnership with communities to develop solutions to complex social problems. Each letter of the care model represents a component of the community mobilization process that organizations and institutions will go through as they partner with myself or with one of our certified measure educators to address uh, whichever problem it is. And so it also provides this, this uh, meaningful way to engage with, with your community. Um, and so the care model, it, you can see C-A-R-E, those mean something. C is for community. A is for advocate with the community. R is for generate solutions that, could, that strengthen community resilience. And E is for, um, is for evidence, to use data and evidence for data-informed solutions. Each time that we use this care model, we dedicate three months to its completion. So it's like a true partnership between a measure, certified measure educator and a community member and their and who we call their care team. And so when we begin with phase one, this is the community engagement phase, we just support them in understanding and aligning on the problem. Far too often, we go directly into creating solutions, right? For all those activists in the room, when we come together, something happens, we just want solutions right now. Well, measure, the measure care model says, wait, take a step back real quick. Let's understand the problem. Let's then empathize with the, with, with the community. Let's, let's, um, let's not just go in there and try to parachute in and make change. Let's understand where, where these folks have been. We also wanna make sure that we strengthen sociocultural cohesiveness through this process. And then we go into phase two. Phase two is the solutions. That's when we're saying, okay, let's, let's really understand the community. What does the community need? We do a light community assessment, a community needs assessment. And then we go into creating solutions and then we support them in developing a theory of change. And then we go into developing community um, uh, impact metrics. And then for, for part three, that's about the implementation of those solutions and, and we show them how to evaluate those outcomes and what it looks like to then share it, share their outcomes online. So these are some of the, re the results from the measure care model and from some of the other tools that we've used. Um, last year, these are 2020's results. We had over a thousand hours of just plain support to black and brown led organizations. We served 13 black and brown led organizations. We have um, an incredible team of over 133 volunteers now that passively work with measure that, um, or that some that just, you know, they give quite a few hours a week to supporting this work. Our work has also um, created some very systemic change <laughs> within Austin. Um, in a unanimous vote, the Austin City Council ended the city's late night curfew for minors. Um, this ordinance, it was an ordinance that made it a class C misdemeanor for anyone under 17 years old to be out in public from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. We got rid of that through data activism. That this was on the law for 27 years. We got rid of that. Our work has also provided some pretty strong um, partnerships with, with academia. University of Texas, um, and which, what, what is also pretty interesting is that, um, and you guys will probably know this since you're in the research community, but University of Texas is a, is a research one academic in, in institution, huge, right? They have data activists like me who will be speaking at their commencement speech this year <laughs> to talk about what it looks like to disrupt research. Texas State University, New York Law, Here's something else that the care model has, pro has produced and what we're working towards right now. So adultification bias 
I'm gonna kind of switch gears here. But a toltification bias is defined as a social or cultural stereotype that's based on how adults perceive children in the absence of knowledge of the child's behavior or verbalization. So when society embraces harmful stereotypes for people, um, like, for example, black girls are promiscuous or black girls or black boys are violent or they're criminal. These are these types of stereotypes that are also attached to children. Adultification bias is, was, was shown through research by Georgetown University back in 2017. They did a report called Girlhood Interrupted. And in that report, they found that black girls were seen as less innocent. And this is research, less innocent. And it wasn't just how, you know, white people looked at black girls, but it was how everybody, how black people looked at white girls, how brown, I'm sorry, black people looked at black girls, how white people looked at black girls. Everyone seemed in this study to look at black girls as less innocent than their white peers, as needing less comfort, as more culpable for their actions. Um, this is how they looked at black girls, starting at the age of five years old. That then translates to some of the disproportionality that we see. That helps us to understand why is it that Black girls are six times more likely to receive out-of-school suspensions than their white counterparts. That gives us an explanation of why it is that we saw, do, do you guys remember a couple of months ago when there was an officer that placed a young lady in the back of his car um, and there was a few officers out there looking on um, and why, when, do you remember the, the little girl kept saying, I want my dad, I want my dad. And the officer said what to her, do you remember? He said, he said, stop acting like a child. And she said, I am a child. She was nine years old. It's this idea of the black girl as less innocent. And so what Measure has done is that we took that research, um, wrapped it around the CARE model and created some incredible local community driven initiatives around that research. We've been able to, um, to create a comic book that community members created. We were able to um, write new policy that right now we have a bill at the house in Texas it's called HB 3045, and this bill is called the Measure Bill. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to require all schools in Texas to report disproportionate discipline data to parents and to caregivers in a way that they can understand. So we don't just say share data, share data in a way that people can understand. Hell, we have asked you to break the pipeline for this many years. Give us the damn data. Let us do it ourselves. Give, parent, give the power back to the people through data. And that's what the measure bill is doing. That is what research to local action looks like. So here's the thing though, if we are not careful, even the evidence-based data movement can become tainted by academia that is far removed from pracademia or even worse from activists like me or removed from blackademia. You see the truth behind data and research racism is complex, it's perverse, it's opportunistic, it has the potential to um, perpetuate a system where people of color become no more than subjects in a petri dish, researched, analyzed, justified by these theological frameworks that we, that they are completely unaware of, that explain away their existence without even asking them. There are countless ways in which the biopic, BIPOC, black and brown people have been betrayed by traditional academia, by data collection, by research, by technology. So as we work to define and, and progress this movement, 
we have to uproot. Remember when I talked about uprooting that system? We have to uproot that system and disrupt traditional research methodologies, disrupt the ways that we typically create technology for people. This is fundamental to the work that we do at Measure and it's, it's quite honestly changing the game. So again, share data. Most of you know that, you know, the collection of like police data is becoming a thing, like we're gonna share data now, right? That's what a lot of the police departments are saying and that's what they're trying to do. Um, there are several organizations that are trying to operationalize that sharing of data. Uh, data.world is one um, here in Texas. Um, another pretty interesting organization is called the Texas Justice Initiative. They're demonstrating how open data can make a difference. I, I, I really love their works. So if you Texas Justice Initiative, write that down. Um, and sharing data within your organization as a best practice is becoming is also becoming an acceptable practice. But the, the thing is, is that we have to make sure that when we share data, that data is understandable to people. So that's one reason why the measure bill is what it is right now, because we have or huge organizations like Texas Education Association that's saying the data is there. There's open data there, but if if open data sources don't translate to supporting the people, then it's not open. It's not there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so think clearly when we talk about open data. What are what do we mean? Who is it for? Why is it there? Why is it existing? And then again, it's also we also we have to embrace research to local action. Yes, data is good. <laughs> data, data and good knowledge should not be left just on the shelf somewhere or placed in a book. It should be in a book. Keep writing your books if you're writing a book, but it, it shouldn't just be left there, okay? It should be liberated, you guys. <laughs> it should be liberated. It should be used as the hammer for social justice. What happens when you take data and you operationalize it? Well, you can change laws. And sometimes you can even change behavior. So difficult conversations like the ones that we're having today are unavoidable uh, when you're addressing systemic issues. But first, we have to collectively understand and acknowledge the fact that despite decades of advocacy, we have yet to see broad reaching changes. We have to be honest with ourselves. Just recently, it took the death of another black man for many organizations to even entertain the idea of equity or making a change. We have to all also realize that we're not gonna get there unless we do have the data and the information. This is a different generation. You can't really get stuff from, you know, past us without sharing with us the data. Prove it. What are the numbers? As we apply data activism as our method, we must not forget that there are historic structures in place called racism that has to be rooted out along the way. It's especially when we're talking about data. Remember, what goes in comes out. Who puts it in? That narrative is also gonna come out. And so I measure we continue to raise awareness about how to dismantle racism through our tools, that's number one, and also by measuring progress through, our, through data and metrics. And so I want to um, take a couple, just take one more minute here. Let me see if I could on the screen. I just want to, I just want you guys to think about this. Um, and I think we can probably use the chat. Um, but first, let me, let me give you guys some, let me, let's center in on language. If that's okay. 
before you before we talk about this activity don't do that yet but centering on, on language there's this first way to understand there's four levels to understanding racism i'm sure that there are way more levels than that but i'm going to talk about these four individual racism this is that first box right there it's an individual's racist assumptions it's their beliefs it's their behavior it could be conscious or unconscious you can kind of see this white guy is looking at this black guy he may be thinking something about him then you see this internalized supremacy racism this bubble over to the right and you know you have a bunch of kids and they're looking at this black boy in some type of way maybe they said something to him that hurt him this internalized supremacy racism is the personal conscious or subconscious acceptance of the dominant society's racist views so it's they have accepted that they that they are better than him it's these are the ways that um, it gives rise to patterns of like stereotypes and thinking about some other group uh, bad or or behaving in a way that's discriminatory that minimizes another group that criticizes that finds faults with them um, and then it can also be um you know the acceptance right of this idea of racism so then you get like this feeling of inferiority in in some cases right and so that's that's internalized supremacy racism and then there's institutional racism and that's that bottle that's that bubble at the bottom to the left and that institutional racism this refers to specifically the ways in which institutional policies and practices create different outcomes for different racial groups many people many you know organizations now are thinking about how do we how do we tackle institutional racism i'm sure that you guys have heard that several times it's th these are the 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 pattern of you know um of laws and policies that just really provide an advantage for whites and continue the oppression for disadvantaged people and then you have over um to the right bottom is structural racism and so structural racism this is really when racism becomes normal and legitimate it's 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 the historical it's the cultural it's the institutional it's the interpersonal it's this it's this routine that always most always advantages whites while producing this adverse negative um, outcome for people of color that's structural racism it's white domination of the culture and so I'm going to ask in your chat group here, and I'm going to ask people if you are a person of color, um, I'm going to invite you not to answer this question. If you're a person of color, if, I'm going to invite you not to answer this question. And if you are not, I'm going to invite you to answer this question, if you're comfortable, all right? Got to make people comfortable. I mostly feel blank when discussing race because. So go ahead and type it out real quick. I mostly feel blank when discussing race because. Again, if you identify as a person of color, I'm, I'm gonna invite you not to answer that. Unless you just can't help yourself. I mean, you know, I can't tell you what to do, but invite you not to. That's me just protecting the, the space, the bodies, the brains, the, you know, um, the feelings of my um, of people that look like me. And so thank you for for answering that for those that are we're not we're not going to talk about it. I just want to give you that opportunity. Here's a couple of questions that we're not going to break out into small groups, but these are a couple of questions that I'd like you to reflect on personally. Um, before I close out, what did you learn? What will you do different? And here's my information if you want to contact me as I'm closing out right now. So in his work, God the Scientist, if you guys have ever read that, 
Paul Penfield Jr. He says, we scientists use scientific theories as long as they seem to do the job. In the same spirit, we can use arguments based on faith so long as they seem to work. And as long as we keep in mind the assumptions made. He goes on to say in that, in that book, without this kind of approach, we would be severely limited in what we could do. Great scientists, especially social scientists, seek multiple views, peer reviews, and the live, and they also look at lived experience. For them, science is a conversation dynamic to the culture of cultures that we share, but experience uniquely. Yes, your experience is invisible, but yes, your experience is real. Some people will try to convince you that just because they can't see your experience, that it's not real. But plenty of real things are invisible, right? COVID-19 is invisible, but really there. Systemic racism, it's invisible, but really there. Both have enormous, visibly visible impacts. <laughs> God is invisible but he's there. Joy is invisible, but it's there. Grace is invisible, but it's so very real. Your experience matters, folks. It's not the whole experience. Your experience is not the whole experience, but it's your real experience. Your experience matters. Your lived experience matters. It's the experience from your view. And if researchers like y'all, like me, if our experience can shape the world from, from our experience, so can you. So can your experience. How you envision the world really matters. So I just, as I'm closing out, I want to um, ask you all to claim your space, to claim your culture, and to claim your canvas as we all work to write this picture, and as we all work to uproot the tree and replant something new. And I will open it up to questions and stop sharing. Amy, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, my main regret about doing these talks remotely is that, um, as Professor Durst said, you can't see people clapping or hear them applauding. So, um, but thank you so much for the talk. I really appreciate it. Um, there are questions in the chat, but um, I kind of just selfishly wanted to ask the first question, if that's okay. Uh, I guess it's okay. I'm in charge, uh, unless <laughs> unless somebody jumps in. But um, I wonder, could you talk a little bit about your um, about ways that students who are interested in your work can can uh, learn more about the kind of work that you do and about the different uh, maybe the difference between research as you practice it and as we are trained to practice it in the university. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there are, um, so I think from the fundamentally at Measure, we believe anyone can, um, can join this work of change through research. We believe that, you know, if, even if you are big mama down the street, that's it. So in my culture, we all have big mama down the street. So she can be an active participant in change through research. Um, our care model is really designed for everyone to be involved. So we even kind of operationalize our volunteers and the folks that come to measure under that care model. So C is for community. So community members are just, you know, th that are just excited about making change within their own neighborhoods. They can come in. Advocacy, that's A. These are folks that maybe um, they are the lawyers or, or folks that just have no problem with going down to city hall and, and raising um, picket signs or be or ready to go um, speak to the mayor or make change through policies. These are advocacy folks. R are our resilience group. And these are people that are very um, interested in how do we do this work and not create harm? And how do we meet the people where they are? And how do we heal as we're doing this work? Um, and then you have your our E 
folks, and these are our evidence people. These are our data geeks. They're people like me that just are interested in like, how do we play with the numbers and understand them and, and um, use data in order to create change? How do we create systems that are, um, that are healthy for our community? Um, and that, that's our E folks. So really at Measure, it's, it's all about, you know, how do we change research to a way that everyone is accepted into this community? Um, I also, I mean, I love academia, right? And so, it, but not every, not, it's not always accessible to everybody. <laughs> and so that's, I think that's the main difference. Um, and then of course, Measure is a nonprofit organization that allows, you know, anybody to, <laughs> to, 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 um, to join us and to learn more about us. Uh, thank you. Uh, Toby Smith, hi Toby, thank you for coming, has a question. Um, he wrote, thank you for your talk. You mentioned earlier that you don't want data to be a flashlight, you want it to be a hammer. There are many groups uh, who argue that the push for more data is dangerous to our most vulnerable communities. Does Measure have protocols to address, or excuse me, to assess these potential dangers and dangerous outcomes or an interest in doing so? Um, definitely an interest in doing so, um, but you know the care model is really our protocol. Um, there, there's several times where we would, well, you know, police departments will reach out and say, "Hey, you know, can we partner with you to 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 do some work and to look at data and so forth?" And there's many times where we have to say no, just because of the fact that honestly the trust isn't built there, um, and so even working along uh, working alongside groups like the police department you have to be very very careful that that's where we you know for example we did some work in San Diego um, and prior to going into San Diego to to hold a conference we had to meet with community stakeholders and community leaders like does this even make sense for your community um, how should we ask these questions? Who should we talk to? And so it's really about being very careful um, because I mean, I've seen where data is, again, it's weaponized against people of color. Oh, well here you have the data now we don't have to do anything about it. And so, so that's, that's really where measure stands at that point. We definitely are, um, are interested in, in meeting with and learning more um, about developing like specific protocols. But right now it's just, you know, us community saying, no, that's, we don't talk to them. <laughs> and that's just the way it is at this point. Yeah, I think that's something that we've talked about a lot. And that's definitely something that I have been talking to your team members about too. But this is a kind of central question that I've been thinking about probably for like the last couple of years. But this kind of, on the one hand, the hope that we could use data you know, to address problems in the communities that we live in and that we're concerned about, but then also these kind of risks that are posed by data. So I, I don't have a great way to think about it, but it seems like in your pra your practice is really built on that kind of, I guess I want to call it like a double bind or that sort of those those two potentials. It seems like that's kind of where you started. Yeah, it is. And, and for us, it's really about giving the data to the people. You know, giving if, if we provide the data to people that are most impacted or that represent the, the deepest disparities or like or their disproportionality, then allow them to show up and say, this is this is my experience and this is the data. And unfortunately, we have to do that as people of color. We have to, we, we have, we share our experience. We've been doing that for, for a very long time, but unfortunately we have to have the data to validate it. And so that's really where measure exists. We're not too much into the institution and, you know, using their, you know, that's just kind of not where we are. We're more, we're very community based and asking community members, what data do we need in order to show this is this is happening to us. This is what we're experiencing, and then we work together in order to to get that data. Yeah, that's super fascinating. It's a, I guess I just think that there's always this risk that we'll end up working. I guess one thing I fear in my own work is like, oh, you would you would do all this work about data and not about problems in the world. And so sometimes there's this risk, like every time somebody wants to say address racism, particularly like in an institution like the university, like, oh, well, we need data. And it's like, well, maybe you actually don't need data in this instance if the harm that we're talking about is well known. You know, it's like these constant demands to produce more evidence. I think 
if not in the care model, for example, but when a powerful institution does it, it kind of can become a strategy to not deal with a problem. So it's like, oh, we need to collect more data. It's like, well, you, you know, I, I answered that survey already last year. Analysis you know? <laughs> paralysis when it just stops everything, right? That, yes. And, you know, and we also have to ask ourselves this question of, of like, what is data? Like what qualifies as data? And that's why in my, in, in my work, it's really about qualifying lived experience data to be data, right? And to be, a, to be actionable data. Um, data that can produce change. And that's what is happening is that, you know, lived experience data is becoming a thing and it's becoming something that we can use in order to, um, to go advocate for change. And so that's, that's really, um, that, that's where measure sits. Well, we should wrap up because we're running out of time. I don't see any other questions in the chat, but can you tell us uh, what issues and what campaigns measure is working on in the coming year? Yeah, definitely. Um, so a couple of things. The first one is HB 3485. I'm really big on sharing what we're doing um, locally at the state level because a lot of times the same type of work is transferable to other states. Um, California, I'm actually a Californian, so I have a very close connection to you guys right now. Um, but this is the same type of language that can be shared to, to create it, your a house bill there. And so if y'all are interested in, you know, in inserting yourselves in this work to, to break the school to prison pipeline, connect with me. I will share with you the bill. I will share with you all of the, all of the material that we've created in order for you to make that same change where you are at. Um, secondly, you know, measure is growing and we are very interested in, in, in bringing in people that are interested in research activism as well and data activism as well. And so we have this program called the Certified Measure Educator Program. Um, we're already kind of through with recruiting for our next cohort, but we are going to do it again possibly fall winter time frame. But if you are a person that's interested in this work, connect with me because we do have an opportunity for you to become a facilitator to learn the measure tools and then to support other um, local organizations as they're trying to be disruptors as well. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks again to the audience for coming. I think we will uh, stop there. I'm gonna actually just pause this recording. <laughs>